It is not easy being a horror fan. It is not easy running this channel because what I'm trying to do here is bring a little respect to a genre which is not received a lot. What I try and do is show you that horror films are worthy of deeper insight, deeper attention, and show you that there's a lot going on in them, a lot of clever themes, a lot of clever references that you should pay attention to. Unfortunately, the biggest counter argument to be made to all this is to point at horror films and often the people who are fans of them. Like I said, it's a hard knock life. And such is the case with the 2016 independent horror film Terrifier by Damien Leone. I was asked to look into this by a kind viewer of this channel and thank you, it was very interesting. Um, you wanted to know my thoughts and these might not be what you expected because when I was watching Terrifier, the main thing I was thinking was, oh, is this defensible? How, how would I defend this movie? How would I recommend it? Uh, is this even a movie actually was the main thought I was having. When Amazon list Terrifier in all its 85 minutes as a horror movie and ask you to pay £3.59 to rent it in HD, are they taking the piss? Now, forgive my language, but it's an interesting question for me. This was what my brain was occupied with. And so we're going to look at Terrifier and I suppose respectability in the horror genre through the lens of piss in three different ways. Bear with me, this, this was a good idea when I was making notes earlier. I really have to pee. Our first stop on this very unusual analytical and urological journey is going to be the Janneke Peace statue in Brussels. If you're not aware of Janneke Peace, it is effectively a sequel of sorts, a response to the far better known, far more established and historical mannequin piece statue that stands in Brussels and has stood since the 15th century. Now, Mannequin Peace is, as I said, of a far greater stature, it's far grander. Janneke Peace is down a little alleyway and it's effectively a far cruder version. Uh, Janneke Peace was made in the 1980s by a businessman, uh, just doing it effectively for a little profit. He owned businesses down the alleyway and he wanted to draw people in. There was a profit motive. It was not strictly an artistic endeavor. Now he did later say there was a sort of gender equality lens to it, but some of the things he said about the motivations are a little odd sounding. I wouldn't look at it too much. For the purposes of this video, for the purposes of this analysis, what I want to do is consider Yannicka Peace, now fairly beloved, as effectively derivative art and how something can be very derivative and still have a fair amount of value. Now this absolutely applies to Terrifier. There is no argue about it. Terrifier is incredibly derivative. It is a killer clown movie. It is based around Art the Clown who basically goes around terrorizing a bunch of characters who are fairly flat. They're pretty one dimensional. There is not a lot going on. And it is frankly very obvious that a couple of characters are introduced purely to take up time. This guy, I feel, was pretty much there to get you an extra four minutes in the 85 minute movie. That of course contains a long credit sequence at the start, a long credit sequence at the end, just to try and pad it out and make sure you get to feature length. They very clearly only had one filming location except for the pizzeria. Um, all the signs in this are of an incredibly low budget, which it absolutely has, you know, the pizzeria that they use is a genuine pizzeria. It's just a business that they had access to and so they thanked it in the credits. This is not uncommon in horror movies. Uh, think of George Romero getting all the backers of his movie to uh, cameo in Night of the Living Dead as the zombies or Wes Craven just taking a couple of kids that were actually on location when he was doing his filming and asking them if they'd like to be in the movie. That's what this is. When you're making movies on a very low budget, you have to be creative and you've got to use what you have. Very clearly, Terrifier had one warehouse location and it becomes increasingly funny that despite setting things in a TV studio, in a morgue, they are really clearly only using the one warehouse over and over again and just, re just redressing it basically to try and get a bit of variety. Once you notice it, it's kind of funny. 
it is largely, in the words of the creator, effectively a feature-length proof of concept for the character of Art the Clown and for the special effects that he wanted to use. He got some backing from Kickstarter to finish all the effects on the movie, uh, very similar to The Void, which I've also talked about. Uh, far easier to defend that film. But for the actual story elements, there is not much there for Terrifier. Uh, a couple of very disposable, dumb characters upset Art the Clown. They just encounter him randomly and uh, he terrorises them and anyone around them and then anyone else who wanders into the warehouse and they're all killed gruesomely one by one until eventually only one survivor is left and not all that much of her. The introduction of this final character, who we see in a flash forward at the start, is actually cool and I, I started off very optimistic. But beyond that, as I say, uh, the story is incredibly bare bones. Uh, really just trying to make it to the uh, minimum feature length so that it could count as a proper movie. Nevertheless, I'm going to say we cannot write off Terrifier just because it's derivative because that would send shockwaves throughout cinema. Frankly, it's all derivatives. We can start in the 1930s with the Universal monster movies and then go through the uh, sci-fi horror golden age of the 1950s and then we get to Freddy Krueger, who uh, this is very, very derivative of, and say it's all, it's all degenerative, it's all derivative, you know, it's all trash feeding on trash, producing further trash, you know. You're going to end up throwing away so much if you do that. So derivative is not necessarily the problem. And sometimes you might say, this the product, this film, it only had the problem of coming later. If it had come before the previous thing, then maybe the other thing would look derivative. Um, and it appears a bit harsh to sort of punish it for its chronology. I mean, a film can't always help its chronology, right? And going back to popular Belgian statuary, Yenneke Peace was not the end of the line. We have the uh, little boy, then we have the little girl, and, you know, we had to follow it up with a dog. So Zeneke Peace uh, followed that in 1998. So 15th century, 1980s, 1998. I don't know what's going to come next in this series, but something tells me that the flow here is going to carry on. Moving on in the analysis, carrying on downstream, if you will, we're going to talk about Last House on the left. Uh, why on earth would I say that? Why does that fit into a piss-based analysis? Well, uh, this scene, obviously. Piss your pants. <laughs> Damien Leon, creator of Terrifier, is obviously aware of Craven. He obviously is a fan of Craven. He leaves a tribute to Wes Craven at the end of this movie. It's a very touching moment in a film that otherwise comes off as endlessly nihilistic and unpleasant and sadistic, frankly. Now, Leon leaves this tribute to Craven, but he also pays a tribute to him right at the very start of the movie. You may have missed it, but this opening section is a clear tribute to A Nightmare on Elm Street, in which a sort of series, I guess, uh, iconic villains, uh, Freddy Krueger and Art the Clown, both start gearing up ready for a... Uh, the events to come. It's something that I actually missed the first time, but I happened to rewatch A Nightmare on Elm Street very recently and thought, oh my goodness, I, I saw the connection that I missed the first time I was watching this. Uh, it's a welcome touch. Now, I wanted to bring Wes Craven's The Last House on the Left into this analysis, not just because of this scene, Piss your pants. which allows me to group it into this weird little analytical lens I've got going on, but because The Last House on the Left received a very similar response to Terrifier. Certainly the response that I felt instinctively that it was exploitative, it was cheap, it was trash and it had nothing to say. Um, it was just endlessly sadistic and absolutely it's cheap and exploitative. You know, the guy had no money, what are you going to do? He was basically given a chance to make a movie for a quick, uh, quick grindhouse cinema that just wanted to throw some content up on the silver screen. But even though it faced some outrage, and the outrage was definitely something that the adverts leaned into to try and get some tickets to this very cheap film, it's not that it has nothing to say at all. In fact, now the last house, now the last house, oh, I can't say it, but nowadays the last house on the left has a lot of high profile defenders. Mark Commode for one, 
has written about how there's a lot of social commentary and valuable social commentary in The Last House on the Left, and I can definitely see that. Now, yeah, there is sadism. There is a lot of stuff that's incredibly hard to watch in The Last House on the Left. Even today, the characters are put through a really horrific ordeal. But it's not saying nothing. There are lessons in there about social decay. There are lessons there about the limits of law and order, about uh, parents being too lenient with their children and how the parental response goes into a vigilante mode afterwards, a sort of realisation of the failings of uh, lax standards. Uh, they're all packed in there and also um, floating around ideas of the sort of um, remaining holdovers from Wes Craven's Baptist upbringing. It's all in there and it can all be unpicked. There's a lot of details you can go into. Uh, later, people would look at A Nightmare on Elm Street and talk about it in similar terms about the idea of the role of the parent and the eroding of its uh, authority in more liberal times and consequences from that. And also throw in ideas of the sort of uh, relevance to the Vietnam War. I, I don't want to go into a big dissection of those films there, but there's lots that you can do and say about it. Now, I am definitely not saying that there is a similar level of grand analysis of massive social commentary going on here or that Damien Leone is of the on a level with Wes Craven I'm definitely not saying that but I don't want us to make the same mistake and completely write off Terrifier the way The Last House on the Left was written off there is definitely one thing going on in this movie that I'm going to talk about in the next section that section is about a chap called Marcel Duchamp and his statue The Fountain Okay, fountain. There is no way that we could have a discussion about whether or not something counts as art without mentioning Marcel Duchamp's fountain. This is it. This is what it looks like. In 1917, he entered it pseudonymously to an art institute he was a member of, causing much controversy. The panel were completely divided over whether or not it counted as art. They accepted it because they effectively couldn't refuse it, but they didn't exhibit it. Now you can obviously understand why there is pushback on this. It is literally just an upside down urinal that the artist bought and didn't even make himself. It's not a replica, it's literally a urinal. It is designed to take the piss of anyone who needs to use it in a restroom, obviously. But Duchamp knows what he's doing. And I think if we pause for a second, we can understand that that instinctive reaction to chuck the fountain out and to say, no, it's not art, you idiot. Terrifier isn't art. We're going to get them and we're just going to put them in a great big pile that we're going to call not art. There they go, in the pile. That's where they belong. Now, obviously, that instinctive reaction makes sense. I have that instinctive reaction. But if we think for a moment, we can step over it. We can go beyond that and understand that Duchamp is doing something clever here. He's not just being lazy. He is not just taking the mick. This isn't the sole thing he did. He bought a pre-made urinal and exhibited it for a key reason. And that is because simply by exhibiting it, it's gaining so much additional context. It's not like he just left it in a store. He took it and displayed it. And by doing that, he knows it's going to incite a load of controversy because it gains a whole load of additional context simply because it raises questions of whether it should be there or not. By doing what he did, he's brought up questions of formalism, artistic requirements that are debated over, and it really seems like a sort of distillation of the debates over modern art and the rejection of prior expectations, prior formal requirements that would have attached themselves to a galleries before. And it feels like a very bold declaration that you can reject those standards and still produce something worthy of being called art. But if you just come and look at it, you think, why is there an upside down urinal there? Terrifier is very much the same. In that, what do I mean by that? Well, you can see Terrifier and say it is just derivative schlock, barely making up the minimum run time to count as a movie. It is admittedly by the director, a practice run of special effects that he wanted to do and got to do in uh, Terrifier 2. I've heard good things about it. Can't say I'm massively inclined to check it out myself, but anyway, 
it may appear like just another killer clown movie, absolutely brain dead, nothing going on, basically only distinguished by the unbelievably over-the-top violent special effects in here. And that is a problem, obviously, but you can be misled by that. You can be misled just the way people who see the fountain as just an upside urinal are misled. What I mean is, we've already talked about how the start of Terrifier is a clear homage to A Nightmare on Elm Street. There is another one uh, that is probably quite accessible to people here that is an obvious reference to Creepshow, a very well-beloved George Romero film. These tributes that come at the end of Terrifier make it very clear that the director is a horror fan himself. He is appreciative of what came before him and he wanted to pay tribute to people whose art he respected and effectively he seems to place his movie in the same tradition of these directors. I'm sure he would be more humble than to say that it's on a par, but it's just a tribute that he wanted to make. And for all the complaints I've made about the one-dimensional characters and the incredibly inane plot and the cheapness of the sets, I could keep going. There is a moment before this tribute to Creepshow that made me think the director is not just making an entirely stupid derivative movie. He knows what he's doing and he knows in a way similar to Duchamp what the criticisms of this film are going to be. And the reason I know this is because I, I'm going to have a hard time saying this in a family friendly way, aren't I? Art the Clown is kicked out of this pizzeria that kindly let them film there for writing his name in feces on the wall. And actually, we don't even know it's his name. He's gone on to be referred to as Art the Clown, but he never speaks in the entire movie. He just delivers exaggerated mime. He never breaks that. So for all we know, he simply wrote Art in feces on the bathroom and has been kicked out for it. Why the heck am I raising this? Why am I making the sound like that? is the saving grace of this movie that actually makes it a really big brain horror film worthy of consideration. I'm saying it because in a way very similar to Marcel Duchamp, he has declared this to be art. It's art made up of feces, the way the fountain is made up of a bog standard upside down urinal. But nevertheless, it is art. Simply doing that is I think a very clear nod that he's aware of what the accusations are going to be and that nevertheless terrify accounts as art. Or possibly I'm massively overthinking this. Who knows? That's what I do on this channel. I mean, hey, look, overthinking horror films is my raison d'etre here. It's what I do. It's also not the first time I've had this kind of thought. Um, I was just prompted to make a video about it. I had a really similar experience with a film made 10 years before Terrifier, uh, Hatchet from 2006. Hatchet looks like an incredibly stupid ripoff of a ripoff of Friday the 13th. It is superficially incredibly stupid. Now, similar to how if you don't have a good grounding in horror movies, you are not going to notice and get these references to classics that are in Terrifier, in Hatchet, if you don't have that knowledge, you aren't going to get the references that are being made. Uh, the, uh, you know, you're not going to appreciate the cameos by well-known, well-loved horror stars here. And that was a delight in this movie. And you might see the extremely deliberately over-the-top puerile style of Hatchet, the sort of gleeful abandoning of any kind of physical reality in order to deliver the gore you might see that and think it's not parody, it's just a script that has 75 IQ. So just hypothetically, how would you have felt earlier in the film if you hadn't ripped this person's face off for no reason whatsoever? And I'm very sympathetic to that view. I am really not going to make the case that I know this film looks really stupid and goes out of its way to look stupid and minimalist and like it's barely a film whatsoever, but trust me, if you have 140 IQ and have seen these 16 obscure movies that were banned in the 1984 video recordings act saga, then 
you will appreciate it on a different level. I'm not going to do that. I think that's probably far too much effort for most people and I wouldn't even try and sell them on it. I, I would barely even try and sell horror fans on this. But if you are a horror fan, you might appreciate it. You might appreciate the comically increased level of gore. Maybe that's about it. I do have a problem that I know a lot of people are just there for the gore. Um, the commentary itself in Terrifier, it's not really worth it. They're cute little references, but to make it a full film, if it does, it's it's not what I'm going to recommend. I think I'll probably just rewatch Triangle or The Void. I really enjoyed those. Anyway, <laughs> maybe unnecessarily big-brained attempts to understand a killer clown movie from me, but I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you found it interesting and um, probably the best piss-based analysis you're going to hear on YouTube this week. I will leave it there. Um, if you want to see more of me, I do my Thursday live streams at 8pm UK. I think the next one up is going to be the menu, but maybe I take ages editing this and it's something else. Uh, the best thing you can do is subscribe, like this video, and then uh, check the channel and you will see what horror homework I am assigning for that week's stream. I'm going to leave it there and uh, I hope you enjoyed this. All the best. Thanks y'all. Tschüss.